In 1863, at the height of the Civil War, Abraham issued a proclamation, not the one you're probably thinking of. The more famous Emancipation Proclamation did come out that year, but later on in the year, he issued another proclamation setting aside a day for giving thanks. He requested that all Americans ask God to commend to the, his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in this lamentable civil strife, and to heal the wounds of our nation. Hardly sounds like the kind of situation that would evoke thanksgiving, does it? And yet those are the very times when we need to give thanks. He established that day as the final Thursday in November, and it became a national holiday. It was celebrated then all the way until 1939, when President Franklin D. Roosevelt moved the holiday up a week in an attempt to spur retail sales during the Great Depression. Roosevelt's plan, derisively known as Frank's Giving, was met with passionate opposition, so two years later he set it back to the fourth Thursday in Thanksgiving, and it's been there ever since. I think Thanksgiving has now been replaced with Black Friday, which is the day after Thanksgiving. Now, I'll be honest, I, I love Thanksgiving. I've mentioned before, this is my favorite holiday of the year, but I'm not so sure it's a good idea that we set aside one day a year and call it Thanksgiving. I mean, are we giving the impression that it's okay to be as ungrateful as we want the rest of the year? Maybe we ought to start a new movement and set one side a day as a day, we call it grumbling day, and then all the other days we give thanks. How does that sound? I think that would be more uh, beneficial. Now, throughout this month of November, we are considering Thanksgiving as a way of living. Not only enjoying that holiday and all that goes with it, but making it a part of our regular existence and practice. Last week we saw the aptitude of thanksgiving as gratification, the ability to be content, to be satisfied with what we have. And we saw that being ungrateful being dissatisfied can eat away at our spiritual vitality. This morning I want to turn to the attitude of thanksgiving, which I would suggest is gratitude. I know that phrase, attitude of gratitude, has become so popular it's almost a cliche. It's almost lost its meaning. But I do believe that it is an important truth that we must grasp. We will see that it is the very beating hearts of a spirit-controlled life. It's not dependent upon people. It's not dependent on circumstances. But it's rather dependent on a confident faith in the Lord. In fact, I would suggest to you that gratitude is an expression of our faith. We can only be grateful when we realize that we don't deserve the blessings we have and that we're not the ones who generated them. It's exactly the opposite of that infamous Thanksgiving prayer that Bart Simpson once gave when he said, Dear God, we paid for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. Now, we might chuckle at that, we might groan at that, but let's really stop and think, how many times are we living it, even if we don't say it? How many times do we look to ourselves and, and in the words of Nebuchadnezzar, look at this amazing kingdom that I have created? When we become too self-reliant, when we become too self-dependent, we lose sight of the fact that everything we have comes from God. And a good way to keep us from doing that is by consistently giving thanks to God 
for everything we have. Developing an attitude of gratitude. Even when things don't go the way we want. See, it's easy to give thanks when everything's going well. It's easy to be grateful when we have all that we need and more. But what about those times when we don't? What about those times of disappointment? What about those times of grief and loss? Is it possible to give thanks in those occasions? Can we truly be grateful in those times? And I believe the answer is yes. It's not easy, but it can be done. And I think that it is important that we do it so that we bolster our faith. When we develop this attitude of gratitude, we let go of this provincial preoccupation with ourselves. We stop living with this sense of entitlement that the world owes us something. We can be grateful for what we have. So I want to begin this morning with the prevalent command of gratitude. While the word thanksgiving itself appears about 25 times, at least in the New International Version, there are 138 verses throughout the Bible that deals with the subject of giving thanks. There's others that deal with rejoicing and happiness and joy. So this is something that's very prevalent in the scriptures. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 50 verse 14 says, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. I think sometimes giving thanks can be a sacrifice because we don't feel like it. It's not really how we're feeling at the moment. But when we give thanks anyway, I believe that's a sacrifice of thanksgiving and God tells us we should do it. Psalm 105 begins, Give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known among the nations what He has done. That last half of that verse we're going to get into more next week. It isn't just about giving thanks to God in a private setting, but it's also glorifying God, giving Him the glory to those around us, making known, not just among the nations, but how about our neighbors, our family members, our co-workers, our friends, not what we have accomplished, but what He has done. Psalm 107, verse 8, we read earlier in the call to worship, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. This is a clear command and an expectation of God on us. In the New Testament, we see this theme running through the entire book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Always thanking God. In chapter 2, verse 7, he speaks of overflowing with thanksgiving. Can you imagine having so much gratitude in your heart that it just overflows? Even when you don't expect it, it's there, overflowing with thankfulness. In chapter 4, verse 2, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful should be a regular part of our prayer lives. But I ask you, how much of our prayers are giving thanks? For most of us, it's a small percentage compared to how much time we spend asking for things. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking for things. I'm not saying we cut that down. What I'm saying is maybe expand how much we give thanks for what he has done. Give thanks for the prayers he has answered, because they are certainly present in our lives. And then, as if to sum up the whole idea, in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Every verse in that paragraph, he injects gratitude. Give thanks. Be thankful. Be grateful. Whatever you do. This is God's command. Now, unfortunately, this idea of gratitude has been relegated by some to an optional thing, something that we just do in the the spirit of the season. When it comes to uh, the end of November and we gather and the crops are all in, the harvest is done, and, and we give thanks and praise. Well, that's good, but that shouldn't be the only time we do it. Gratitude is sometimes looked upon as that which good Christians sometimes do instead of what really should be the mark of every believer. We all can't do the same things, but every single one of us can give thanks. And we should. This is something that is really commanded of us. Don't forget Philippians 2.14, kind of the other side of the coin. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Isn't it? That's tough. But you want to know a good way to fulfill that? Give thanks. When we are grateful, we're less likely to be grumbling. Think of the Israelites in the desert, right, in the wilderness. God is providing for them every day. Literally, they are in the desert. And when they wake up in the morning, there's food laying on the ground for them. They don't have to do anything but go and get it, basically. But what do the Israelites do for 40 years? Gripe, gripe, gripe. If it had been up to me, the book of Numbers would have been called grumbling. Because that's all they did. I can't believe God put up with it for 40 years. Well, he didn't with some of them. Now, they had every opportunity to be thankful for what God provided for them, but they chose instead to grumble. And as we're going to see, that's a choice every one of us has. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5. This was a passage that we always loved as kids, memorizing verses because they're so short, right? Verse 16 Be joyful always. In the King James, it's rejoice evermore. Two words and you're done. Verse 17, pray continually. Another two words. Verse 18 is a little longer, but it wasn't hard. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Notice, these are commands. They're not suggestions. Now, I, I have to confess, um, I, I came to a, a bit of a rude awakening this week, because verse 18, in everything give thanks, I have often said we are to give thanks in everything, but not for everything. That seems to make sense. And then I read in Ephesians 5.20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was really brought home as I read from the writing of Johnny Erickson. Some of you may know that name. When she was 17 years old, this young, vibrant, athletic girl dove into Chesapeake Bay, didn't realize she was diving into shallow water, hit her head on the bottom and broke her neck. And she's been a quadriplegic ever since. And she writes, most of us are able to thank God for his grace, comfort, and sustaining power in a trial, but we don't thank him for the problem, just finding him in it. And she talks about how she has gotten to where she can thank God for her disability. How can you do that? 
because she is focusing on what that has done in her life. It has made her more dependent upon God. It has made her more thankful for those things that she has. And it's taken decades of her life, but she has come to the place where she can say, I thank God for the wheelchair. I thank God for my disability. Folks, that's faith. I think that speaks stronger than being able to quote the whole Bible or perform a spiritual gift. That kind of gratitude speaks volumes. And that's how our faith grows. Gratitude is important because it reminds us who we are, but it also reminds us whose we are. We belong to God. We need God. We need one another. Why is it so important that our little children, we teach them to say please and thank you? You say, well, that's that's just common courtesy. (laughs) Newsflash, it ain't so common anymore. But when it comes to saying thank you, you may not realize it, but what we are doing is we are teaching our young children to appreciate others because we need them. And when we say thank you to God, it's a way of saying I need him too. And remember, these are commands, not suggestions. This brings us to the personal choice of gratitude. Now, I will confess, there are feelings that are involved when it comes to giving thanks. But giving thanks is not an emotion, it's a decision. We must choose to be thankful. Henry Nouwen writes, When there is a reason for gratitude, there can always be a reason for bitterness. It is here that we are faced with the freedom to make a decision. We can decide to be grateful or to be bitter. It's a choice. Nancy DeMoss shares, Over the years I have sought to make gratitude a way of life, and I have experienced many of the blessings that accompany this attitude of gratitude. However, I have seen that if I am not ceaselessly vigilant about rejecting ingratitude and choosing gratitude, I all too easily get sucked into the undertow of life in a fallen world. I start focusing on what I don't have that I want and what I want that I don't have. My life starts to feel hard, wearisome, and overwhelming. Again, this is a command which makes it a choice. It, in fact, involves every part of our being. It's a choice, so it's an act of the will that requires constantly renewing my mind with the truth of God's word, setting my heart to savor God and his gifts, and disciplining my tongue to speak words that reflect his goodness and grace. Until a grateful spirit becomes the reflexive response in my life. We don't have to think about it. We just do it. We can build a habit of gratitude. Doesn't rhyme as well, but the idea is there. We make it a habit. And you know how you build a habit? By choices. You know how people develop bad habits? Choices. You know how you break a bad habit? Choices. You know how you develop a good habit? Choices. It's something that happens. It doesn't happen to us. We make it happen. We're not going to wake up one day and all of a sudden be grateful. (laughs) It's going to be the product of our decisions. We have to choose gratitude. Because, as was suggested, every time there's an opportunity to be grateful, there's also going to be the temptation to complain and grumble. And we're going to have to choose between the two. Now, this issue of gratitude is far more significant than the lightweight reputation it has gained might suggest. And we might think it's a cute little cameo with our finer things in a reality that's, you know, but truthfully, 
it's something that's much more powerful and necessary in our Christian life. It's not just an extra thing. Try, for example, to sustain persevering faith without gratitude, and your faith will eventually forget the whole point of its faithfulness, and it'll harden into a practice of religion that's hollow and ineffective. You just go through the motions. You don't even know why. You just do it. And there's just nothing there. Try being a person who exudes and exhibits Christian love without gratitude. And over time, your love will crash hard on the sharp rocks of disappointment and disillusionment. Try being a person who sacrificially gives of yourself without the offering being accompanied by gratitude, and you'll find every ounce of joy drained by a martyr complex. True gratitude is not an incidental ingredient in the Christian life, nor is it a standalone product, something that never actually intersects with life, safely denying reality out of its own happy island somewhere. Gratitude has a big job to do in us and in our hearts, and it's one of the chief ways that God infuses joy within us. We don't give thanks because we have joy. We have joy because we give thanks. It's a decision. It's a personal choice that we must make. And I I think the importance of this matter of gratitude cannot be overstated. I've come to believe that Few things are more becoming to a child of God than a grateful spirit. You think about it. Someone who is truly thankful, you just want to be around them, right? And on the flip side of that, there's probably nothing that makes a person more unattractive than the absence of a grateful heart. So finally, I want to consider the positive consequences of gratitude. Few things can change a person's life more dramatically than developing this attitude of gratefulness. Your attitude does indeed alter your altitude. It affects how far you will go in life and how much you'll enjoy the journey. Even secular psychologists say that gratitude is the healthy way to go. I thought it was rather recent because I'm just now hearing about it, but it's actually gone back years. Dr. Hans Selye, who is kind of the pioneer in research of stress and how that deals with a person's body and life, claimed that gratitude produces more energy than any other attitude. And so people are often being told that are struggling with depression, that are struggling with a variety of mental health issues, develop gratitude in your heart. It will change the way you think and the way you feel. Now my question is always, okay, I'm supposed to give thanks, but to whom? (laughs) Because they're not going to tell you to give thanks to God, but we all know that's where it needs to go. Give thanks to God. It'll do wonders for your mental health. To a significant degree, your emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual well-being as well as the health and stability of your relationships, will be determined by the amount of gratitude you have in your life. Cultivating a thankful heart is a safeguard against becoming a bitter, prickly, sour person. A grateful child of God can't help but be joyful, peaceful, and radiant. This attitude of gratitude will bring a whole host of blessings And it'll make you a channel of blessing to others. So it's not just yourself that improves. You're going to become a channel of blessing to other people. There's a lot of power in those words, thank you, when spoken genuinely. It can change a gloomy atmosphere into a bright, merry one. Giving thanks is liberating. It changes Conditions such as negativism, pessimism, and cynicism, and changes it to giving thanks. It immunizes us from the disease of resentment. We can truly make thankfulness 
an attitude of the mind and the heart. But ultimately, it is a choice we must make. It is our calling. It is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. Any ingratitude is like a virus in our souls which infects and poisons everything we do or say or touch. Ingratitude might seem harmless, but it can absolutely devastate your life and the lives of those around you. If you get a chance sometime, read the last half of Romans chapter 1. It talks about the kind of the snowball effect of sin in society. And you'll see right at the very beginning where Paul is describing that, he says, neither were they thankful. You, know, you don't think of ingratitude as necessarily you know, the root of all evil, but it really does produce a lot of problems in our lives and in our relationships. As a follower of Jesus Christ, my attitude should be one of gratitude. It will change my disposition, and it's going to attract others, not necessarily to me, but to Jesus. And really, that's what it's all about. In Africa, there's a little berry that's called the taste berry. It is called that because it changes your taste so that everything you eat becomes sweet and pleasant. I really wish I had had that growing up. Maybe I would have learned how to eat broccoli and cauliflower and all that garbage. <laughs> Someone has said that gratitude is the Christian's taste berry. If you take an attitude of gratitude and devour it in your being, it turns even the difficult, sour things of life into something sweet. Remember God's word. Be joyful always. Pray continually in everything give thanks. For well, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through Him. The attitude of thanksgiving is gratitude. Not just one day a year, but every day of our lives.